Welcome to All Grown Up Now, Tales of a Checkered Past. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is an evolution of the tale, All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts. This is season two, and it's called Tales of a Checkered Past. It's a collection of short stories from my salad days on up to the present. In each podcast, another self-contained story will be presented. These podcasts will be broadcast bi-weekly, so you get two a month. Enjoy. This episode is called The Mermaid Dress. The time is late 1990s, the place San Francisco. As I've said before, I had a theory that my studio in San Francisco attracted nut jobs. A friend of mine said it was because the studio felt like a safe space, something I agreed with. These nutcases usually arrive looking like normal people, only to catch me by surprise. This is one such case. One Friday afternoon, my friend Belinda, a talent agent, called. She had a model girl who she thought might like my work and had some money. Could they come over and have a look? So, late in the day, Belinda arrived with this gal, a Nicole Kidman lookalike, with the red hair, the white skin, and the blue eyes. So, I'll call her Nicole. She was very pretty. Her story was that she modeled in Paris at one point and had moved to San Francisco after divorcing her husband. She was living temporarily at the Hotel Monaco, rather pricey digs, I might add, and modeling to pick up some extra money. Nicole started looking at my work and talking. And talking. And talking. It seemed that she never stopped to take a breath. It was just a torrent of words. Talking, 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 talking. And trying on clothes. And looking fabulous in all of them, I might add. She started this stream-of-consciousness monologue with her experience as a model in Paris, which, of course, I believed she was really beautiful. Then she cruised into a story about being in on the development of a laptop computer. I just figured she was one of those smart model girls who put their money in tech stocks, this being the late 1990s. After that, Nicole downshifted into a story about helping Mother Teresa with the poor in India. Huh? I inwardly rolled my eyes. But then came the kicker. Nicole looked me square in the eyes and said in all seriousness, You know, if Dodie had gone out with me that evening, they'd both still be alive today. This was not long after Princess Diana's car crash. The look in her eyes made the hair on the back of my neck go up on end. I realized this gal was crazy. I also realized I had to amend the lipstick theory. As I said before, my friend Jackie says that any sane woman can hit her lip line with her lipstick. I discovered that the models are the exception to this rule. I thought, oh my God, another nut job has found her way in. So I assumed that the rest of the visit was just theater for my Friday evening amusement. She wouldn't be a real customer, just one more of the crazy people that my studio attracted. Nicole kept putting on and taking off clothes, and again, looking fabulous in all of them. But at one point, she had on only her earrings. While averting my eyes, I suggested that perhaps she might be more comfortable going into my changing room. This was really more for my comfort, as well as everyone's safety. I always say that I either burst into flame or turn into a pillar of salt if I saw a naked woman for more than a moment or two. If I burst into flame, it would set the place on fire and, well, you know. Standing there with hands on hips and tits and lady parts to the wind, Nicole stated, I've changed in front of a thousand people on the Rue de Rivoli and I'm not embarrassed. But I am, I replied, drawing aside the curtain please step into the changing room. The next piece she wanted to try on was the mermaid gown. I explained to her through the curtain how to fasten it up. When she stepped out 
of the changing area, Belinda and I both gasped. Nicole looked devastatingly beautiful in it. She regarded herself in the mirror and asked, how much? As I was still regarding this whole exercise as theater, because she was crazy and therefore I didn't actually think she would buy something, I shot for the moon. $8,000, I said. Okay, she said. Could you deliver it to my hotel on Monday? I can leave a check with the concierge. Very well, yes, I'll do just that, I said. Soon after, Belinda and Nicole left, and I felt relieved to be done with this. I didn't believe for a moment that she'd actually go through with this transaction. I get a call later on my answering machine where Nicole, for one reason or another, would back out of the transaction. So with that, I locked up the studio and went home. Friday evening. The next evening, Saturday, I was getting ready for bed. When the phone rang, it was Belinda. She wants the dress tonight. She wants you to deliver it to her hotel room, Belinda said. No, I said. She wants us to deliver it. I'm not going to watch her walk around in her birthday suit again. But I'm already in bed, she protested. Well, you can be dressed by time I get there, but you are going. So I went to get Belinda. We went to my studio to get the dress. We then went to Nicole's hotel and got to her room. We put her into the dress. She sat down. She wrote out a check for $8,000. We had a little chat and a little snack. We finally left. This check is going to bounce, I said to Belinda as we pulled out of the parking garage. What will you do then, she asked. I'll just go collect the dress, and this whole thing will be just another amusing story to dine out on. The following Monday morning, right when I got to the studio, I immediately called Nicole's bank to see if the check was indeed good. The lady on the phone said that there was enough in the account to cover the check, so I ran, not walked, to my bank to get the check deposited. I explained to my banker what was what and told her to see that if she could get the check through as quickly as possible. Then I went back to the studio. As I felt I'd earned my money that day and I felt a little stressed, I decided to go to the gym. So I got my gym bag, left the studio, and began to walk down the sidewalk. As I looked ahead of me, off in the distance, was Nicole. Crying, crashing into buildings, looking disheveled, thankfully not wearing the mermaid dress, clutching one of my postcards. Uh Uh-oh. My first thought, uncharitable as it was, was, fuck, that check's gonna bounce. As I watched her making her way down the sidewalk, She started talking to two guys who were unloading a truck. They were looking at her like a hungry dog looks at a steak. A steak that was wearing a small fortune's worth of jewelry to boot. In a few more moments, it looked like she would end up in trouble in the back of that truck, so I had to step in. Even though I didn't want to, in the interest of fair play, I knew I needed to. I ran up to the truck and Nicole seemed relieved to see me. I asked what was wrong, and she started crying and babbling. She was making no sense at all. She was crazy. Great, I thought. So what do they do in the movies? I always ask myself what they would do in the movies. Acting like this was the most normal thing in the world, I said calmly, Nicole, let's go back to my studio. It's too hot out here, and you're overheated. We'll go to the studio, I'll get you something cool to drink, and you'll feel much better. So, I led her back to the studio, sat her down in the showroom, and got her some cool water. She wanted to write a note to fax over to her hotel, so I got her a pad of paper and a pen. Soothingly, I said, Nicole, here's the pen and the paper. 
You sit here, you drink your water, and take as much time as you need. I'll be in my office doing some work. While she was drinking and writing, I ran into my office and called Belinda. I got her answering machine. I left a message. God damn it, Belinda, get the hell over here. We've got trouble. Call me. Then I went back into the showroom. Nicole had finished her note and asked me to fax it to the hotel. Since the fax machine was in Marshall, my studio partner's office, I went in with my portable phone, called the hotel, asked for the guy she addressed the note to, and faxed the note over. The writing on the note itself looked like psychotic scrawlings and gave me the creeps. Marshall was observing all of this and asked what was going on. I just said, not now, later I got trouble. The guy at the hotel didn't know what Nicole was talking about in the note and asked me if I knew. I said I didn't. Could you send a car? I asked. She's distressed. We don't do that, he responded. But she's distressed, I said. We don't send cars, sir. But she's really distressed. Don't you think she should get back to your hotel safely? Send the car. 1156 Howard. Send it. Send it. Send it. Send the car. Send the car. Send it. 1156 Howard. Got it? About 10 minutes later, there arrived a long white limousine, complete with the burly driver wearing the black Armani knockoff suit and Ray-Ban sunglasses with too much gel in his hair, carrying a cell phone. It was so rock star going to the Betty Ford Clinic. I gave Nicole a pair of big sunglasses, led her outside to the car, opened the door, put her in, and calmed her down. I reassured her that they were taking her to her hotel. I closed the door. They drove away. Phew. Later, Belinda called. It seems that Nicole had gone off her meds. I'd never seen this one before. This story has a happy ending, however. The check cleared. But that wasn't the last crazy person to find their way into my studio. Thanks for listening. You can get the audiobook All Grown Up Now on iTunes, Audible, and Amazon, or from my website, allgrownupnow.com. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have any questions, you can reach me through the website, allgrownupnow.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Kenneth D. King on Facebook at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, kennethdking.com.